One participant shared that the K-State Garden Hour series is delightful, informative, and helpful. Eight out of 10 K-State Garden Hour participants reported increasing their physical and or emotional health through the skills they gained in our webinars. 82% of Kansas Garden Hour participants harvested fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs they grew with the help of our webinars. 90% of K-State Garden Hour participants reported they used unbiased and research-based information to solve plant and garden problems after participating in our webinars. Plant Heroes Wear Purple. Discover K-State Garden Hour at ksre-learn.com slash k-state garden hour and become your own garden superhero. everyone. It is 12 o'clock and it's time for the K-State Garden Hour. Welcome to our 2022 series. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you are a regular, welcome back. We're happy to have you continue with us. This webinar series began in the spring of 2020 as a hope to share extension gardening education during the height of the pandemic. Um, it's been a great success and we have reached over 16,000 garden enthusiasts uh, just like you. So this webinar is hosted by the Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Sharon Ashworth. I am the Horticulture and Natural Resources Agent for Douglas County. And everyone involved in this webinar series is an extension professional for K-State. Most who have a background in a horticulture subject or related discipline. Um, but what we all share is a love of gardening. And this series is a team effort um, to share our passion and knowledge for all things gardening. Now, a few uh, housekeeping details before we get started today. If you have a question, please put your question in the Q&A feature. Down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button there for Q&A. That is where we will find all your questions. If you put a question in the chat, it might get lost because sometimes a discussion gets going in the chat and we miss questions. So please, if you have a question, um, put that in the Q&A session, and our moderator of the Q&A today is Lynn Lowry, and she will be monitoring those questions to ask our presenter. Um, our other moderator today is Cassie Holman. She will be monitoring the chat. Um, all the information we provide, if we put links um, or add additional information to, for the presenter, that will be placed in the chat. And those links will then again show up on the K-State Garden Hour website. This presentation will be recorded um, and you'll be able to find that on the K-State Garden Hour website following the presentation and all those links will also be found on that website. So uh, with that said, please make sure you keep your, um, as, well, everything is muted. Um, there will be no speaking parts on that on behalf of the participants, um, but please put your comments in the chat and questions in the Q&A. Today's topic is Recommended Trees for Kansas, presented by Dr. Jason Griffin. Dr. Jason Griffin is a professor and extension specialist with expertise in woody ornamentals and industrial hemp. Dr. Griffin is the director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center in Wichita. Please give us a few moments while we transition here and get the presentation up on the screen. Thank you again for joining us. Good afternoon and thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna assume everybody can see that. If not, somebody's gonna let me know. Otherwise we'll just go forward. Thanks for that introduction, Sharon. Um, good to be with everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is which is recommended trees. These are recommended trees, so we're going to uh, not get too adventurous and too crazy, but we're going to go through this. Welcome to my plant torture chamber. Um, we did have an open house a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully some of you came by and, and, and saw it. Um, we are located a little south of, a little south of Wichita um, on 120 acres of, of beautiful sandy loam soil, and we know how to torture trees. 
Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. We are a full service horticulture facility. We've done a little bit of everything over the years. We are in our 51st year, uh, 51 years we've been doing this down here. I know we're talking about trees today, but just give you a little bit of background about this facility here. It is a, an off-campus off research and extension facility uh, located within the Eastern Kansas Research and Extension Centers. Uh, like I said, we've done a little bit of everything under the horticulture umbrella. Uh, we've got an active um, turf grass evaluation program, uh, which, is, which is administered sort of through the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program. So we've been doing that for lots of years. We've done lots and lots of fruits and veggie work over the years as well. We have a, an active program in um, certified organic sweet potato uh, production, which is a fun thing. We're getting ready to harvest here in about 14 days. So that'll be fun to see if the summer has affected our crop at all. It's been a little brutal down here. Of course, ornamentals. Uh, we've, we've dabbled with bulbs in the past, spring bulbs, summer bulbs. We've done annuals, we've done perennials. Uh, like I said, a little bit of, of everything. Uh, we, we have tried some ornamental grasses, which is a fantastic plant to, to use around the state, uh, around the region. And we have recently ventured into industrial hemp. We're in our fourth year of, of conducting research on, on industrial hemp as well. So like I said, we've, we've done it all over the years and we've done a lot recently, but Kind of what we're known for for the last 50 years has been work with trees, um, trees and shrubs, woody plants in general. Um, it's one of my passions. It's one of where my training came from, and it is certainly a need within the state of, of Kansas. I probably don't need to tell most people on this on this webinar, um, but we try to grow trees in a pretty rigorous environment. Um, Kansas is not like the rest of the country. Uh, we have some unique challenges here, uh, which makes growing trees quite unique. Our winters are bitterly cold with rapid temperature fluctuations. Our summers are aggressively hot. Um, our precipitation is uh, sketchy at best and widely varied across the state. If you're in the southeastern corner of the state, you can pretty much count on getting almost 45 inches of precipitation a year. If you're in the western side of the state, you're looking at about 15 inches of precipitation a year. There aren't many states that have that sort of variability from one side of the state to the other. So coming up with recommended trees for Kansas is, is a challenge uh, because we have some challenges that, that other states just don't have to deal with. Um, it goes back to selecting the right plant, putting it in the right place, planting it the right way. Um, anybody who's heard me give talks before knows I'm, I'm a big fan of doing things right the first way uh, because there are no shortcuts when it comes to getting trees in the ground, getting them established and having a successful tree. If you try to take shortcuts, mother nature punishes you one way or another and nobody's happy when, when that happens. So first part of that, of course, is, is selecting selecting the right, the right tree. Um, we have soil issues we have to deal with. Um, high soil pH makes a big difference. Those are red maples on the left and those are hackberries on the right. I don't know as, as though many of those trees would make my recommended list, but if I had a soil pH of, of eight, which is what's on this site, hackberry is looking awfully good. Excessive drought. Um, and heat, plant selection makes a big difference. Just because that plant in the front was on sale or readily available, obviously not the, not the best choice for, for every area where that Arizona cypress in the back is kind of taking 100 degrees and doesn't care. That top picture is uh, one of our turf grass plots in the spring of 2011. Uh, if you remember 2011, it was with the hottest, driest uh, summer on record in, in Wichita. Um, that was sort of, we were done with that plot. So it got no irrigation. That was the plan in the last year, no irrigation. Um, and the bottom of that is, the bottom photo is that same plot in September. So that's what turf grass does 
in one summer with zero irrigation and a record setting heat and drought situation. Uh, I put that picture in there because it, it makes a point, it reminded me to make a point about the importance of tree selection. Why is he showing turf pictures to talk about tree selection? Um, that turf plot in September of 2011, we run through there and, you know, with a, a cut the thatch, rough that up a little bit, throw some grass seed down on it, water it. 12 months later, we've got a great looking pot of turf. Um, it doesn't happen that way with, with trees. If you've got 20, 30, 50 years invested in a tree, um, you don't want a single weather event to, to destroy that because you've got all that time invested. You can't replace that tree, that 20 year investment in one season like you can with, with, with your turf grass, with your lawn. Um, so that's why choosing the right tree is an important part of, of, of tree selection. We are unique here in Kansas. This is national data. Uh, this is shade trees sold by wholesale nurseries across the country in 2019. USDA does this study about every, about every 10 years. Um, these were the top seven shade trees sold in, in 2019. Uh, oak, which is broad, there are, as if to, to suggest there's only one oak, um, they, they categorized all oak under the same umbrella, unfortunately. So oaks in general were the top sellers. But if we roll down that list, red maple, certainly not, not recommended for every situation in Kansas. Japanese maple, um, I mean, I've got one in my yard, but I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. It's a challenge growing. River birch has some issues that we'll talk about. Willow, I mean, it's a, it, it needs a lot, a lot of water, which we often can't provide here in Kansas. Sugar maple, we like sugar maple. Linden, be on the fence with. There's some pest issues um, that, that, that can make it really unsightly. So in your top seven trees sold in the United States in 2019, there aren't very many in there that we would recommend, widely recommend in the state of Kansas. Um, so we're a little different. We're a little different. We have some resources for you. Um, they are online. These are some online ones. Um, you know, top left, some drought tolerant tree recommendations that we put together after our record setting uh, heat and drought of 2011-2012. On um, the right, top right, we've been looking at conifers for, for several years because of pine wilt disease. We'll talk a little bit about conifers here at the end. Uh, bottom left, the Kansas Forest Community Service Program has a nice list of preferred trees for various regions around the state. Uh, that list was put together by um, some of the people on, on this call, by, by uh, recognized experts. Uh, and bottom right is a publication put together by the Kansas Nursery and Landscape Association um, uh, sort of some effective landscape plants, um, really kind of some small pictures, just bullet points on, on good plants that, that are recommended by a nursery organization within the state. And you can pick that up at almost any one of your, your local nurseries. So there are resources out there. That's just a few of them. Um, there's lots of books. Uh, and there's, of course, the infamous Google machine, which I should point out does not always have 100% accurate information. Um, so beware your information. Hey, so let's talk about some trees that we like, um, that we've had some experience with over the years and we've become fans of. This tree is one of my current favorites. Um, that has a really, really unfortunate name. Seven Sunflower doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. And I normally save this one to the end and I am running out of time and I have to skip over it. And I didn't wanna do that. So I moved this one up this, um, for this presentation because it is just about right now at that phase you see on the large picture on, on the bottom. It blooms like the first couple weeks of, of September. It's a little bit later this year for some reason. It's, it hasn't quite opened up all the way, um, but it's just got nice lustrous green leaves all summer long, no matter how hot and dry it is. And then boom, first half of September, it's in full bloom. And if you're into pollinators, you would like this plant. I, it, every, it's crawling with anything that goes after pollen. Bees, beetles, flies, ants, butterflies. It's just alive with, with, with pollinators all over it. Uh, after those flowers fade, the sepals remain. And a couple of weeks later, they turn this kind of rosy pink color, which is what you see in the top 
picture. Um, so it's a rather large shrub or small tree. We have ours limbed up, so it makes a nice small tree. And then those, those, those rosy colored sepals, they're on there almost at the end of October. So we get almost a month's worth of, of interest out of this plant just in its flowers, flowers and sepals. Then on the top picture, there's what those sepals look like in a, in a couple of weeks after the flowers fall off. They're fantastic. And then once the leaves fall off, you can get a look at the nice white exfoliating bark underneath. Um, it, it's just a great plant. We've had no issues with it. It's perfectly cold hardy all the way up into the, the upper Midwest. Um, we've seen it growing. I've seen it as far south as Oklahoma. I'm not sure if it's gonna be really happy in Texas, um, but it's a widely adapted plant. Um, which I would love to see more people, more people try. Again, unfortunate name, Seven Sunflower. It's an ugly name for a great plant. Some of our native plants, uh, Eastern Redbud is again, widely distributed across the, the Eastern half of the United States. Um, it's, it's one of our natives. It's a pretty rugged plant. Uh, the, the, the landscape for Eastern Redbuds, Redbuds in general has, has been has been completely changed in the last 20 years. There was always, you know, the purple one, the white one, and that was about it. Uh, and now there's multiple cultivars with multiple interests out there. We've got yellow leaves, uh, like hearts of gold in the rising sun. We've got variegated leaves. We've got weepers. We've got weeping variegated. We've got purple leaves. We've got purple weeping. we got purple variegated. We have single flowers. We have double flowers. They're all over the place. The plant breeders have been busy and there's some great plants out there. Um, they like a well-drained soil. Uh, they're not gonna be happy in a saturated soil. They like you know, maybe half a day of sunshine. Um, they will take some shade, but the more shade you get, the less flowers you get. Um, th there's some great ones. We'll, we'll just take a look. So yeah, so here's the, the, the native distribution of, of Eastern Redbud uh, on the Eastern half of the United States. And you can imagine when you get a plant that is that widely distributed, you get some geographic differences. And it's kind of funny as you start those plants up in the, up near Pennsylvania and West Virginia, Virginia, the leaves are kind of large, the leaves are thin. And the further West and South you move, the leaves get smaller, the leaves get thicker, they get waxier, all drought uh, preventative mechanisms, drought avoidance mechanisms. And the flowers generally get a little more intense color and purple too. So we actually like looking for some of these um, Eastern red buds that are, that, that are native or their provenance, their, their origin was in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas. Uh, they have just a little different look to them, a little different physiology. So here's the, the purple leaf. And there's a bunch more than, than just burgundy hearts and forest, forest pansy, but this highlights sort of like the difference in some cultivars that we look for and what makes a cultivar good. And forest pansy on the right was the purple leaf standard forever. If you want purple leaf red bud, that's what you got. Uh, Burgundy hearts came out a few years later and the color is in our location, it might be different where you are, in our location, the color is not a whole lot different. Um, but the plant's different. But just look at the shape. If you got one, you want one for your landscape, I'll take that nice sort of compact, well-behaved burgundy hearts on the left over that forest pansy on the right, which I'm gonna have to get out there and prune because it's a mess already. Um, so it's just things to keep in mind when you're, when you're selecting plants. There's the Chinese red buds, which are shrub form. Uh, there's a few different varieties on the market. They're a little less hardy. So we like to put those sort of in a protected space, um, maybe closer to the house because they are more shrub form. Uh, but they're nice because they flower all the way from the soil line right up to the top of the plant. They're really nice. Again, there's lots of weepers out there. Lavender Twist on the right is sort of the um, kind of the industry standard, the most popular one right now. But if I was choosing, this is the one I'm going for, uh, Traveler, which is originated um, out of Texas. It is a Texas variety, Texas form of Eastern Red Bud. So it's got glossier leaves. Uh, the flowers are a little more intense color when they bloom. It's just a little more drought tolerant and, and better adapted for our environment, I think. Magnolias. Um, I love the group of magnolias. Um, I will confess that up front. I, I am biased. I'll, there's not a magnolia I won't try. Um, we'll kill some of them, but that's okay. Um, but some that probably won't be killed, some of the standards. This is star magnolia. It's been around forever. 
large shrubs, small tree with, with some age and limit up a little bit. And there's lots of variations on star magnolia. There's lots of cultivars. You can get some, some pink ones or just tiny blushes of pink. Um, there's even some that kind of are a little more intense on, on the red side. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a tougher plant than a lot of people give it credit for. It's perfectly cold hardy. It does well in our, in our heat and drought situations down here. Um, in an irrigated landscape, it's just fine so long as it doesn't get too irrigated. Um, if your irrigation is running every day, you're first of all, you're irrigating too much, um, but your trees aren't going to be happy with that anyway. Um, it, it does like a well-drained soil, but it's perfectly fine for us. We, we, we like star magnolia. Even though it's been around forever, not new and exciting, it's still a good one. Saucer magnolia is sort of the when you think about magnolia is what a lot of people think of. It's that tree in spring with these huge blooms that all the neighbors stop and look at for that one day before we get a freeze and it turns to mush. Um, well, saucer magnolia is, is a, it's, it's a really tough plant. The plant itself is, is rock solid. It, it, it's easy to grow, well-behaved, doesn't have a whole lot, of, whole lot of issues. It's cold tolerant, heat tolerant, drought tolerant. It'll, it'll, it, it'll take most landscapes um, around here, that, that's, that's for sure. The issue is those flowers, they just as they are about to open and you can't wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow's gonna be the day when all those flowers are gonna open and you go to bed and it drops down to 15 degrees that night and you wake up in the morning and everything's turned to mush. Um, that happens frequently with this plant. About every other year, about, about half the years, we get a good bloom on it. Half the years we get what they get frosted. Um, for me, it's worth it because the blooms are fantastic and the tree's nice afterwards. Be on the lookout for a new cultivar, which I do not believe has been named yet, but there is a new selection out, which rumor has it blooms a solid two weeks later than the standard saucer magnolia. Um, so that would avoid those, those freeze issues. So be on the lookout for that. Um, as soon as it's available, trust me, I'll have one. There's a whole bunch of yellow magnolias out there. Um, We've grown a few of them. Uh, this is one called Golden Ray, which we really like. Um, it's very hard to find. Uh, we haven't, a nurseryman gave this one to me several years ago. We've had three of them, we've been watching them. We've only lost in the last 15 years, I think we've lost the blooms to a, a late freeze twice. Um, so I like, I like those odds. Nice, well-behaved plant, nice foliage, nice flowers, um, cool, you know, red swollen seed pods when the, when, when the fruit are ready. Um, but this is golden ray. If you can find it, go for it. Um, we're trying to propagate it and see if we can see if we can generate some interest in this one. But there's, there's lots of them out there if yellow magnolias is, is your thing. Southern magnolia. Uh, don't let the name fool you. It's, it is perfectly adaptable for a large part of the state. I've seen them growing in Kansas City, you know, in a, in a relatively protected spot. Um, they're widely, widely uh, used down in the Wichita area. Uh, but this is a great example of knowing um, which plant you're getting and making sure you get the right one. Um, evergreen leaves, which we love. Uh, we don't have enough evergreens. So evergreen leaves, beautiful fragrant flowers. And I love those seed pods. Um, I love those cones in the in the in the fall too when they start uh, when they start to rupture and those red those red fruits come out and they hang on those little strings and the birds love them and fantastic plant um, but knowing which variety is key. So on the left we have teddy bear, on the right we have Bracken's Brown Beauty. So you go into a nursery and you've got teddy bear or Bracken's Brown Beauty side by side, you're probably going to walk out with teddy bear more times than not. First of all because it has a wicked cute name. Uh, it just, it's a lot, it just sounds better to the ear than Bracken's Brown Beauty. Um, and it's got this cute little round leaf like a teddy bear's ear. And it's got the nice um, brown uh, tomatose underside of the leaf, um, which is what people look for in Southern Magnolia. But we've tried three of them and we get them through, uh, we've, we've tried them three different times. We get them through a couple of winters and then we, we get a cold spell and they all look like Teddy Bear on the left, which all the leaves are frozen and brown uh, and that plant is now gone where Bracken's Brown Beauty just keeps on going. Bracken's Brown Beauty is the most cold hardy Southern Magnolia that we know of. It's perfectly hardy in this part of the state. Um, great flowers, definitely worth looking for if you're interested in Southern Magnolia. 
um, make sure you look for a Bracken's Brown Beauty. Don't fall for the cute name. Chinese fringe tree. Now we have an, an American fringe tree, um, native on the little further east of here. Um, it's more shrub form um, and the flowers aren't as impressive. And it's not as heat and drought tolerant, which is why we prefer Chinese fringe tree. Uh, we limit up to make it a little more tree form. Um, it tops out around 25 feet tall, maybe, maybe as tall as 30 if it's a good site, uh, 25, 30 feet tall. Uh, equal round, 20 feet wide. And it's just got these great flowers that bloom just about Mother's Day. So we're looking at mid-May, sort of right around Mother's Day, they're, they're in full bloom. I would advise you, if you're thinking about Chinese fringe tree, to go to the nursery and buy one when it's in bloom. Uh, there seems to be um, a, a lot of variation in flower intensity. Some, some plants just have a few flowers on it. And then there are others like this one we've got, which just blooms its heart out. So great white blooms, really dark green leaves, really drought tolerant. Um, this plant in, in the, the droughts that we've had, it doesn't scorch, it grows well. We don't see any damage the following year. It's perfectly cold hardy. Uh, it's just kind of unique, kind of interesting and kind of different. You don't see a lot of Chinese fringe trees around um, so they really stand out when when they're in bloom. Definitely worth uh, worth worth trying if you're if you're into trying something a little different. Oh my gosh, another great plant for us with a horrible name, right? Nobody wants a flesh flowered euonymus. It doesn't sound like a tree. It sounds like something you go see the doctor for. Um, but flesh flowered flesh flowered euonymus really needs a different name. Um, so this tree is a small tree, again, topping out around 20 feet tall. It's got glossy green leaves all summer that look like they have just been waxed. They always have that glossy sheen to them, which is great. Dark green, the trunk and the branches almost would remind you of a beech tree. They're smooth uh, and, and kind of whitish, not white, but they're smooth and a light gray. So that's attractive as well, but the fall color is amazing. And you can see by the plants in the background, they've already dropped their leaves. This is one of the last ones. And it is fire engine red every single year. It has never failed us. The leaves, doesn't matter how early the frost comes or matter how early the freeze comes, it always turns this bright red for us. Um, and I, the word of caution I would have for you is when people hear the word euonymus, the first thing they think is, oh my gosh, invasive. Uh, we have never seen a seed in office. Um, I have been, uh, National Arboretum has, in Washington, D.C. has a nice grove of these, and I was walking underneath them when they're in bloom, and I was checking out the ground underneath. I didn't see any seedlings coming up there, um, so hopefully this won't have that invasive tendency uh, that some euonymus do, and even if it does seed out, hopefully, again, as we talked about early on, Kansas isn't like every other location across the, across the country. Um, perhaps it won't be, it won't spread here, but we haven't seen that, that issue yet. We should talk about crab trees. Um, flying crab's kind of that one of those trees that just let you know that spring has arrived. Um, they're fantastic when they're in bloom. Um, when I learned flowering crab, when I was a student forever ago, I remember my instructor saying, uh, the one thing to remember about flying crabs is they get every disease known in the plant kingdom. And that was true, I won't say how long ago it was, but that was true years ago. Plant bears have been busy. We've got a nice list of disease resistant crab trees um, that are resistant to all the, the various diseases, the cedar apple rust and the apple scale and the fire blight that, that crabs can get. There are resistant trees out there. And that is one thing to definitely look for is which ones are disease resistant. You don't wanna be dealing with, with, um, with some of these diseases. We've had a long history with, with flowering crabs. Um, we get new varieties in from nurseries and from plant breeders and plant them out and, and check them out and see how they do here. Um, wide variety, uh, variety of flowers from you know, whites and pinks to almost red. Um, great, just a nice, nice group of plants. There's a few I wanna highlight uh, for various reasons. Spring snow on the top left is an old one. It's been around forever. It does get a little bit of apple scab, but it's not, not devastating. But I put it in there because 
to the best of my knowledge, it is the only fruitless crab apple on the market currently. So if you don't want crab apples falling on your sidewalk, driveway, patio, deck, whatever, uh, spring snow might be an option for you. Large crab, white flowers, fruitless. Adirondack uh, on the right, I like for its growth habits. It's a little bit narrower. You can see that vase shape. Um, the buds are kind of pink when the, before it opens up, then it opens up to white. Small fruit, which aren't messy. Um, but one of the nice things about this is it is completely disease resistant to fire blight, apple scab, um, cedar apple rust, it, the diseases that are a real problem in crab apples. This is resistant. So definitely um, worth considering. Royal raindrops, prairie fire, you know, if you're looking for pink, you go to the nursery and say, I, I want, a, I want a, a pink or a red um, crab apple. This is probably where you're going to get steered. Uh, I don't have a preference for either one. They're both, um, they both have these nice, nice pink flowers, a small red fruit. Um, the big difference between them is prairie fire blooms maybe 10 days earlier than Royal Raindrops. Royal Raindrops is one of the late, later ones to bloom. So you can kind of, by pricking, picking your cultivars, you can sort of extend your flowering season that, that way too. Um, but both of them disease resistant, good plants. Um, I wouldn't shy away from either of them if you're looking for a pink crab apple. June snow dogwood. We shy away from dogwoods here in general um, because when you say dogwood, people think flowering dogwood, which is kind of iffy. Uh, we reserve that for the uh, gardeners who are a little more adventurous. Uh, but June snow has been a success for us. Uh, we received it when it was a new plant. Uh, it just hit the industry, it just hit the market. Uh, and these plants have been pretty fail proof for us. Uh, they got nice big leaves, it does wilt down on a hot, dry summer day. In the morning, it pops right back up. So if, if you've got an irrigated landscape, it'll be perfectly happy there. Beautiful flowers in June, um, just covered in these white blooms. Very horizontal tree. The branches are spread, spread wide rather than up. It tops out around 15 feet tall, um, but it's a broad spreader. So give this one a lot of space. Starting to see it um, pop up around town, just, just driving through town in June, you can really this really stands out and you can see it in, in some different landscapes. Amurmachia, another great plant with a really unfortunate name. I like to describe this plant as probably the best tree that you've never heard of. Um, I really like this plant. Drought tolerant, heat tolerant, cold tolerant. Um, it's a legume, so it's nitrogen fixing. Um, it is not invasive, it doesn't spread. It's covered in these flowers like the first week of July when nothing else is in bloom. It is a medium sized tree, tops around, tops out around 30, 35 feet maybe, um, and maybe 20, 25 wide. Small leaves, um, so when the leaves drop in the fall, they're not, they're not messy, they're easy, they, they decompose quickly. Seed pods aren't you know, big black like red bud seeds or coffee tree seeds, they're relatively small seed pods. Um, just there's, there's really nothing I don't like about this plant. As it ages, it kind of shades itself out on the inside, so it makes a great patio plant that you can see through. Uh, it's not really dense on the inside. I just, I really like this one. It's not widely available. It's getting there. Ask your nursery professional and, and see if they can find you one. I'm going to say the bad words, Osage Orange. Um, our facility has a long history with Osage Orange. My predecessor, Dr. John Perrow, the facility was named after, spent a lot of his career looking for the perfect Osage Orange. I won't go into all the details, um, but we know Osage Orange as thorny with those huge messy fruit. Um, well, we have several selections of Osage Orange which are thornless and fruitless. So you take away the thorns, you take away the fruit, which you end up with is a medium-sized tree that is probably the toughest thing on planet Earth. Um, it can survive almost anything that we can throw at it. We've had some pretty significant ice storms around here that have broken almost every tree on the station, except this one. It won't break under ice, the, it holds up the wind. Um, there's a reason it was such a widely used windbreak tree. Um, I don't need to go into disgusting detail on it, but um, it's a really, really tough plant with thorns and fruit taken out. Wichita is one cultivar. Um, 
and there's there's several others. There's about a dozen cultivars out on the market. Um, they're not easy to find. Again, ask your nursery professional and hopefully they'll be able to find one for you. Chinese pistache um, is a really tough plant. This is on the recommended street tree list in Phoenix, Arizona. So that's how heat and drought tolerant it is. Um, I would not push this one up to Kansas City, but if you're in the southern half of Kansas, give it a shot. Most of them are grown by seed, so you get this range of, of fall colors. It's heat tolerant, it's drought tolerant. Uh, you get everything from no fall color all the way to oranges, reds, yellows, almost kind of purple. Um, so if, you're, if fall color is important to you, um, maybe go to the nursery and get yours in the fall so you can get the fall color that you want. The one issue that we've, one negative issue is it's on everybody's list for invasive plants. Um, those blue fruits, the birds love to eat them, the birds love to spread them around. And you can see this landscape bed um, is just full of tiny Chinese pistache seedlings. The tree is dioecious, you have male and female trees. So we have been looking for really, really nice male trees. And we found this one, we've got our eye on, we've got a nursery out west that is, that is propagating it. It's a male Chinese pistache, which turns this beautiful red fall color every year. Um, we'll see. We'll see if, if there's a demand for a male fruitless red, um, tough as nails tree. I, I think there is room in the market for that. Let's talk maples for a little bit. Um, there's a lot of maples out there. Don't just focus on autumn blaze. There's lots of other maples out there and some of them are really good. Um, so consider what species you want, um, consider the size, fall color, um, think about how the plant grows. Here's trident maple. We love trident maple. It's tough. I mean, it, it's drought tolerant, it's heat tolerant. It's a good plant for us. It's perfectly cold tolerant. It's got a really nice glossy green leaf. It's got interesting bark when it gets some age on it. Um, the bark kind of exfoliates and you get these hints of, of orange underneath. It's a 35 to 40 foot tall tree. Um, there are some cultivars out there. Aaron is one that we have on station and the fall color, it's just fantastic. It is fire engine red every year. It's got great exfoliating bark. Um, it's out there in the market. It's probably might be worth checking out. Paper bark maple is, I will just, again, without going into gross detail, it's tougher than people give it credit for. Um, it's cold tolerant, it's heat tolerant. Uh, it's got tough, thick leaves on it. It is the poster child for gorgeous exfoliating bark. That cinnamon color bark is fantastic. Um, the only negative thing I'll say about it is it's slow. It's slow. So when you plant it, don't expect this thing to grow as fast as a lot of other maples. It's just slow. It's worth it. If you've got a spot where you need just a gorgeous tree with fantastic exfoliating bark um, in beautiful fall color, it's worth it. Um, but don't expect this thing to, to grow two, three feet a year. It's just gonna grow a few inches a year. I think one of our favorite maples right now is Shantung maple. Um, medium size, 40 feet tall, um, great looking leaves, fantastic fall color. Again, heat tolerant, drought tolerant, that's a common theme for us here. Everything's gotta be heat and drought tolerant. Um, cold tolerant, of course, you can, you can push this one up in the Iowa and Michigan pretty, pretty easily. Um, most of them are grown by seed. They're starting to get a few cultivars out there now. Fall color can range from yellow to red. So again, do your shopping in the fall if it's important to you or get a cultivar. Again, there's only a couple. Get a cultivar that, that has that red fall color. Um, great plant though. We haven't seen any seeding out like silver maple, um, no surface roots. It's just been a really good plant for us. Maples. I will mention, this is all I'll say about red maple. Um, red maple is the number one selling shade tree in the United States. Um, it is not probably the best selection for lots of places in Kansas. Those two factors combined is why we, this spring we installed a red maple cultivar evaluation. Um, again, it's the number one selling tree, but it has some issues. It's got some, some uh, insect issues. It's got some iron chlorosis issues. It's got some bark cracking and sun scald issues. Um, but we are, we just planted this this spring. Give us a few years and hopefully we can find if you gotta have a red maple, again, there's lots of good choices out there, but if you gotta have a red maple, hopefully we'll be able to make a recommendation 
or one or two that perhaps seem a little better adapted um, to, to our situation anyway. So stay tuned for that. Uh, one of our babies, Caddo Maple, um, has been a sort of a signature plant for us. Uh, on the left is John Pear. Uh, Dr. Pear selected this. It was named uh, after his untimely passing. Uh, it was named after him. But these plants are not your typical sugar maples. They are really heat and drought tolerant. They are high pH adaptable. They are cold tolerant. And if you get John Pear, you get fire engine red fall color. Uh, Flash Fire is sort of the new kid on the block, uh, released by one of, one of the big nurseries out west. It also has nice orange to red fall color. Um, it's a good grower, should be widely available in, this year and the coming years in, in the nurseries. Um, but take a look at, at cattle maples for a sugar maple, which is Kansas tough. Autumn Splendor, another cattle maple that Dr. Pear selected. A little more typical sugar maple growth habit, but nice red fall color, orange to red fall color. Um, just another, another great selection. River birch, um, we've been doing some work on river birch. It is a, it's a widely used tree. Uh, it has some issues. Uh, it, it's easy to grow and it's easy to transplant, which is why it's so popular, but it has some issues. It doesn't really like drought. It doesn't really like heat. And so you get like on the bottom of this picture, you get early leaf drop in June and July, which people don't, don't particularly care for. So we're looking for, some river birds that might be perhaps a little better adapted. Um, but the tree doesn't like high pH soil and it doesn't really like heat and drought. Just keep that in mind. Um, it's flexible, um, but under a you know two inch ice storm, we do get some breaking. Um, it's got some great bark on it. Uh, there are different cultivars out there with some bark is better than others. Um, so again, know which cultivar you're, you're going for. Heritage is sort of the industry standard. Um, but this is what happens in a unirrigated landscape with just a seedling river birch. You can see it's yellow, um, which I'm a little bit of a tree snob. I want my green trees to be green in the summer. You can see it's yellow. It doesn't like the pH. Um, and you can see it doesn't like the, the heat and the drought. And the, the ground is littered with leaves. So we're trying to get past that. If you have an irrigated landscape, you have a low spot in your landscape where water tends to collect, this might be a, a, a good option for that. Um, I, I, it is a little troublesome. We often see this plant planted as a multi-stem, like three river birch together in a pot or in a, a bald and burlap. And that, you know, as an eight foot tall tree, they look great and people love to put them right on the corner of their house. Um, but this tree gets large. It'll get 50, 60 feet tall eventually. Um, so get it out away from the corner of your house a little bit. Um, you'll be happier and the tree will be happier. Coffee tree, another native. Um, you couldn't kill it if you tried to. It, it is really tough. It grows native out, out in the Flint Hills. Um, seed pods are really the only problem. Uh, it's got large seed pods, which are kind of a nuisance. Um, but again, the tree is dioecious. So you get male and female trees. Choose the male cultivars, and you get you know a nice big shade tree with small leaves, which again aren't a mess in the fall when they drop. And you get high pH adaptability. You get great heat and drought adaptability. Um, large tree though, make sure you've got the space for it. I wanna wrap up here with um, some of the work we've done with, with, with elms. So several years ago, we, in, we became part of this program called the National Elm Trial. Uh, we we're one of 17 locations um, looking at 18 different elms and elms in general are easy to grow, easy to transplant, fast growing, um, but they have some issues and they have a bad reputation. People think uh, Dutch elm disease, they think, oh my gosh, I can't plant elm, or they think Siberian elm, which is weak wooded and has some issues, or they think uh, lace bark elm, which can be kind of invasive. So there's lots of subtle nuances with elm, which is the reason we did this, we took part in this trial, it's a 10 year trial, looking at, 18 different taxa of, of elm across kind of the upper Midwest. And we're one of the more Southern locations. Um, this data is available online. You can Google National Elm Trial. It's centered out of Colorado State. Um, so you, you should be able to find the data from all the different locations. 
and it comes up in this PDF and you get a little bit about the location. So there's our information, when we planted, where it was, how many cultivars, and just any, anything notable about, about the location. So you can find this data online. And then you can scroll through and you can see there's pictures of the trees. There's a little bit of information uh, about each tree. You can see uh, Lace Bark Elm on the left. We were one of the only locations that could do it really well because we were in the more southern locations and Lace Park isn't super hardy when you get much further north in Kansas. <clears throat> you get survival, 100% um, survival on 100% survival on, on many of them. We, we did really, really well. Um, but we had issues that we had were a little bit of wet wood, which you can get on elms. We had some uh, flea weevil, which just kind of puts little holes in the leaves, doesn't really damage the plant, it just kind of makes the leaves a little unsightly. Some varieties affected more than others. Um, there were lots of different species of elms and complex hybrids that were in the project. And not every elm, you can see here on the right, not every elm um, did really, really well. So uh, it's good to look at that data and see, find a location close to where, you're, where you are who may have tested these plants and see, see how, how they did. I was partial to the American Elms, sort of nostalgic. There's a couple of different varieties that did really well. New Harmony, um, Lewis and Clark, um, Princeton, and Valley Forge were the, were the true American Elms in our trial, and they all did really well, uh, as you can imagine. Fast growing, rapid sh shade, um, just a good, good growing trees with, without a whole lot of problems. I am going to look at my list and see if there's any one last thing I want to cover before I call it quits. I will wrap up with, ooh, we love oaks. And I just want to wrap up with our current favorite oak is uh, Texas red oak. And five, 10 years ago, you couldn't have found this at the nursery, now you can. Uh, most of the nurseries have this. Texas red oak is native to the hill country in Texas. If you've been there, it's hot, it's dry, um, it's limestone soil, uh, so it's really high pH. And we take acorns of, from trees down there, we bring them up here. They're perfectly hardy for us and they don't care about our high pH soil. They're perfectly fine with our heat and drought and we get this great red fall color. So if you're looking for a nice 50 foot tall, 40, 40 to 50 foot tall shade tree um, with small acorns, not super messy, with good red fall color, look for Texas red oak and you'll, you'll be happy. It kind of looks like a, a traditional red oak leaf, um, but the leaves are green all summer long and great red in the fall. And with that, we are at time where we would love to take questions and I will wait for one of my other hosts to take over and I'll stop sharing. Jason, this is Lynn. I'm going hey, Lynn. to... I'm going to give you some questions. There's tons of them. A lot of good comments, a lot of good questions. I've tried to answer a lot of those. Awesome. So back, to, back to magnolias. Uh, a lot yes. of questions on, are you familiar with Betty or Jane? Um, Cold yeah, so the, the, the little girl series. Yeah, there, there's a yep. few of them. So we are familiar with them. We've grown them. They're perfectly fine. I, I left them off here because we were talking trees and I consider those to be more shrub form, but yeah, they're they're perfectly fine. Um, yeah, we've got we've got Betty, which is doing really really well here, so I, I wouldn't hesitate to to use those at all. Okay, and you know know the million dollar question is where do I find these different species, particularly the Caddo maple, the John pear, or some of the, the other ones you list? So. A lot of these trees that we talked about, you will not find at your big box stores. Um, I won't go into that, but you won't find them at your big box stores. Check out your local nursery. I'd, any one of the, the local nursery guys around this part of the country are gonna know what Caddo Maple is. So I wouldn't hesitate at all um, to go to your local, local nursery guys and say, hey, I want these trees. If enough people ask, they will find them. Um, the John Pericato is not a mystery anymore. There's, you know, the largest nursery in the country, how in Oregon is growing it. So it's available. You just need to keep asking for it. Okay, next one, Catalpa bungii, the umbrella yeah. Catalpa. Are you yes. familiar with it? I am. What can you tell it's, us? 
Like, that was an easy question. Yes, I am. Um, so, you know, it, it it is what it is, right? It's a it's a catalpa, so it's super tough. Um, it's a it's a strong weeper, so it's not going to get very tall. I think the biggest ones I've seen down here at the Bell Plain Arboretum are probably 100 years old, and they're you know 15 feet tall, wide spreading, um, slow growing because it is a weeper. Um, but yeah, if you if you're looking for one, there's lots of them around town. They're they're doing really well. I, I, if, if that if that uh, if that floats your boat, that's what you're looking for. Then then I wouldn't hesitate at all. It's a good plant for us. Okay, how long does the Wichita Osage orange take to grow? Is it slow, fast, medium? So it is a fast growing tree. If you get a young one, and I, I, will, I will enter this, this into the discussion. Um, if you get a young one, it's gonna grow rapid for the first five years, like most trees do. When they're young and juvenile, they grow fast. Once they hit 10, 12 years, they start to slow down, they don't grow as fast anymore. So it's gonna grow rapidly for the first few years. Um, and you can expect it to, I mean, you can expect, gosh, you get one in a container or a B&B, and &B, I mean, you can expect it to reach 20 foot tall in, in, in just a few years, uh, five, six, seven years, but then it'll slow down a little bit. Okay, another one. Uh, Frontier American Elm, what about it? Hmm. Frontier um, is Frontier is a good tree. Um, I have seen it. We had it in our trial, um, and for whatever reason, it didn't do well on this location. It was not one of the best ones here. But I have seen numerous ones in nurseries, in landscapes, in botanical gardens around here um, that have done very, very well. Medium-sized tree, fast-growing tree. Um, I wouldn't hesitate at all for whatever reason, whether it didn't like our soil, our sandy soil, or, or our high pH, for whatever reason, it didn't perform well at this location, but it's a good tree. I, I wouldn't hesitate. Okay, questions about oaks. Are there any oaks that are resistant to oak wilt that we know of? And questions on Texas red oak. Yeah, so... The, the red oaks tend to transmit the disease more so than the white oaks. So if that's an issue in your area, you know, look for chinkapin oak, look for, um, look for um, Quercus bicolor, or swamp white oak, um, look, look for oaks that are in the white oak group if, if the wilt is, is an issue for you. Um, and what was the question about Texas red? Is it a slow grower? Uh, what is the genus species, do you know? Ah, Quercus, um, oh my gosh, Quercus texana is the, is the genus species. And again, as a young tree, it is pretty rapid. We've, we've grown several from seedling here. And again, they get to 20, 25 feet, you know, in a matter of four or five years um, from seed. And then, then they begin to slow down like, like most trees do. Okay, um, some of the others are comments that uh, just talking about different trees that are doing well. Um, windy areas, any tree in particular that might be good for a windy unprotected area in Northeast Kansas? So we talked about a few of those. Windy unprotected area, you're talking about um, I mean, you're talking about as rough an uh, environment as you can get. So you think back to some of those really tough plants like the Osage orange, like the American elm, um, plants which have been used traditionally for those windbreak situations like catalpa. Um, I wouldn't hesitate to, in the Northeastern Kansas, I wouldn't hesitate to even venture into some of the Maples like trident maple would would probably do well there. Um, yeah, we can we can follow up with with individuals on specific recommendations like that. But there, there's options. Then there was a comment about non-native species. Are they still okay for the ecosystem and pollinators, that sort of thing? 
So I, I, I have a strong opinion about that, um, but I will try and temper my comments a little bit. Um, so I am fine with people using non-native species. Um, if you want to use native species, go for it. I mean, good for you and, and, and go for it. Um, so we take some things like say the seven sunflower. I know there's issues about non-native species and pollinators, um, bees, butterflies, beetles, they don't care what pollen they're getting, they just want the pollen. Um, they don't care what plant it comes from. Um, so th the issue for me when it comes to non-native species is I want to avoid anything which is aggressively um, invasive. And there's there's lists for that. And we, we do our best to try and stay away from invasive trees. Um, and you know some trees that are invasive like calorie pear, which is spreading like crazy. Um, plant breeders have been working and there are now sterile versions of, of calorie pear. So if you want those white flowers and a tough plant, but you don't, you don't wanna participate in the invasive nature of the species, look for, the, look for some of the sterile cultivars. And then we must have someone on from Tennessee because they say, what is the best way to eradicate mimosas? They are very invasive and great problem here in East Tennessee spreading into the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and crowding out native plants. Yeah, so I, we didn't do it. So I, I did my schooling, my master's and PhD at North Carolina State in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I'm familiar with mimosa and I'm familiar with seeing um, the roadsides covered with, you just covering mimosa. Um, mimosa tends to spread in disturbed locations. So construction areas um, like along roadsides uh, they they don't invade into a dense forest very well, or if they do, it's really really slow. Um, the mechanisms for control, I mean, I mean, there's herbicides that we can use to reclaim that, um, just to spray them to kill them out when they're you know when they're pushing new growth. Um, talk to your um, talk to your Department of Ag. Every state Department of Ag has invasive species. Uh, people on, on staff that can probably help you answer those questions. Okay, one more, seven sunflower. Mm -hmm. Will it tolerate high pH soils and would it grow in Western Kansas? I would love to know if it would grow well in Western Kansas. If I were in Western Kansas and wanted to grow seven sunflower, uh, first of all, I would try it. I think it'll take high pH soils. We, we're right around seven, eight to eight. And I know Western Kansas gets, gets above eight. Um, but I would definitely try it. I've seen it in some pretty, I've seen it in some pretty rugged environments. It doesn't grow as rapidly and as happy as it does here, um, but I've seen it surviving some pretty tough environments. I would put it someplace where it's getting a little bit of protection from that awful southwestern wind in the summer, um, and maybe you can get a little afternoon shade, but I would definitely try it and let me know how it works, please. Okay. One more question about they have verticillium wilt in the soil that killed their Japanese maple. And yep. So they're looking for a replacement tree. That, it's a small tree for that kind of area. Yeah, so verticillium wilt, soil borne disease, which it will take out any kind of maple. So stay away from the maples. Um, it will also take out red buds. So stay away from that. Um, you're going to want to plant something. Small trees that won't survive or that won't get very soon. Well, try the seven sunflower, try the crab apples, um, see if you can find one of those amiromachias, um, but stay away from red buds and anything in the maple group. Okay, and there's a few questions on English ivy and the detriment to trees. Any comments on that? So, English ivy can pre aggressively crawl up a tree, um, but it the only harm that it causes the tree is if it shades out the leaves. It doesn't, it grows on the bark. It doesn't grow into the bark. Um, it doesn't, I guess if it was too moist, it could cause some pathogens underneath it on the bark, but like it can pretty aggressively grow up a tree without causing any damage at all until it starts to shade 
the leaves. Then it becomes then it becomes a, a problem. But I mean, how to control it is you can I mean, you can spray it to kill it. Just keep it off the leaves of the trees. Spray the the, the stuff, or you just cut the the cut the um, vines as they're as they're low to the soil to the soil surface. Uh, cut the cut the vines and pull off what you can, and the rest of it will just fall off as it dies. very much. Thank you all for um, attending. If you didn't get your question answered, or as most people, you think of the question once the webinar is over, please contact your local horticulture agent. Um, and there are a wealth of information for more suggestions and answers to your questions. Um, also remember that this, is being, this has been recorded and this presentation will be on the K-State Garden Hour website tomorrow afternoon, along with all any of the links that were provided in the chat. Those will also be available on the website. Uh, we hope that you uh, join us next time. Uh, one other thing, you will get a, receive a, um, a questionnaire. Um, if you could at all uh, give us some feedback on this series, we would love to have your feedback. So your participation today will be followed up with a short questionnaire and we really appreciate you giving us your feedback. Next month, we have October 5th, Improving Soil Health in the Landscape and Garden. Dr. Deanne Presley, Professor and Extension Specialist for Environmental Soil Science and Management, will be next week. And I want to thank Dr. Jason Griffin for joining us again today. That is one of, as all us agents can attest to, it's a very common question we get, what do I plant? Well, now you have some answers. Um, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.